I'm your host, Ben Garcia. This is Secrets Revealed here on Truth Frequency Radio. As always, we thank all of you for taking the time to join us this evening. I do hope and pray that everything is coming through loud and clear. I apologize. Uh, the past couple of weeks, I've had problems with two computers going down and even a new one that I ordered uh, kept freezing up. And so we're trying to overcome all of these complications. Uh, I have as special guests with me this evening, my son, Justin James Garcia, who is the author of a prodigal biography and also works with me in the ministry doing all of what we do through sacredwordpublishing.com. And so, Justin, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, loud and clear. And I'm looking forward to the broadcast this evening and to typically on um, the outline that you shared with me. So I think it is going to be a very interesting show. But if you would, whatever contact information you would like to share, uh, with the listening audience and where people can go to find and support your work, your Facebook, anything of that nature that you'd like to share. Sure. Yeah, I'm Justin James Garcia. You can find me on Facebook at Justin James Garcia. Uh, I'm with Sacred Word Publishing. And my wife and I started a ministry called Engine. You can find us on YouTube. Just search up E-N-D-G-E-N and you'll find us. We're a mission-minded ministry that's just aimed at sharing testimonies of missionaries and getting people the the heart of the missions and to step away from uh, their keyboards you know and to really get involved in the world and to want to share with their loved ones and their co-workers and their families you know the salvation message and yeah i did write a prodigal biography i think we all have a very special testimony we all have a special gift and we've walked a very unique route in our lives and the most high has preserved us through that route to be able to share with others who are like-minded and similarly seeking through uh, whatever hardships you know we've we've been through and i did go through a few going through the military uh, being raised up with a single mom uh, before we got to know each other and going through uh, hardships of moving you know a d couple dozen times before high school and dealing with friends' deaths and drug addiction, alcohol addiction, things like that, and uh, finding deliverance ultimately because of my seeking for the truth. The, the truth found me and the Most High found me and he showed me uh, who my true father is in heaven and my true purpose in living. And I outline my mission and uh, the life that I was preserved through in that book, a prodigal biography that you can get at sacredwordpublishing.com. And this month we're doing a 15% discount on all books for the back to school discount. And you can get that discount by going to our website, purchasing any print book and typing in the coupon code BACK15, that's BACK15 with all caps, and that'll get you 15% off of all of the print books in your cart. Uh, we also have a really special announcement to, to release to the public as well, uh, even though those of you that support our work probably know, but through Sacred Word Revealed, we are doing a conference here in Atlanta in March of 2020 and next year, and we have a lot of guests, including myself and Justin also will be speaking and even on the topic that we'll be talk, uh, bringing forth this evening, but also Gary Wayne will be joining us, uh, Dr. Stephen Pigeon, Yana and Stephen Ben Noon, and also Dr. Joy Jeffries Pugh. Um, and there may be others at some point we'll announce and you know, add others um, as as we go. But um, it, any, I want to also get you a, a chance to talk about, Justin, you and Joy have been greatly blessed to travel the world and to be able to go to and visit and live with some of the children 
that are part of an orphanage that we support and we have included in our business model a, a tithe which we give away every quarter uh, to different charities and people can find um, those charities that we do support they're found on our nonprofit website endeavorfreedom.net and uh, if people want to support in any manner the things that we do we take serious the whole mandate commissioned to us by God to uh, to serve the orphan, the widowed, people with disabilities, veterans, animals in need, uh, things of that nature. And so can you talk a little bit about uh, your experience traveling and how that kind of opened your mind, broadened your horizon uh, to the way that other people in the world live and you know, how how blessed, how fortunate we are and how um, this this culture, this generation really seems to overlook that as well, because uh, there is a, you know, a lot of depression, a lot of a hardship here in this country, even though we are greatly blessed. But if you would speak of some of your travels and um, some of the lessons, perhaps, that you learned in doing so. Definitely. We are so blessed to have this opportunity to be in this ministry with publishing the sacred scriptures and uh, to be able to give money to the poor. You know, in James 1, 27, it says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And Joy and I were very blessed to have the opportunity to travel. In 2017, my mother was uh, working for an airline and we got basically free tickets to be able to travel. And Joy quit her corporate job, and I dropped out of uh, college, and we started traveling. And we we just had such a eye-opening experience to go and to stay in places that you know we we can't even fathom still exist on the earth. You know, people that live in uh, aluminum siding houses. You know, with open roofs and little pieces of lumber that hold together uh, what what they call a door, you know, and they still have just a small concrete hole in what they call a kitchen where they put their, their lumber that they chop down and that's what they use to cook their food. They burn the wood and that's what they use to heat up a water. They, they have little pails and you put the water in the pail, you heat it up and that's the only hot water you can have. So we went about a month without taking showers because it was the winter time and it was really cold. And I, I don't know how the kids do it, but we stayed with about 30 orphans and they just go and they'll, they'll bathe in the ice cold water. And, you know, for them, that, that's just life. For them, uh, two small meals a day, that's, that's life. And that's what they have and that's what they're thankful for. Because a lot of them come from, you know, more poor places, which one of our brothers, Nalgong, who was a Burmese refugee, who was the warden at Spring of Hope Orphanage where we stayed, um, that's where he's from, and that's where he's still going. So we have, we partner with him to go back to the lands that he was from, and to go to those villages and to pick up orphans and to offer them a life where they can get education and have clothing and have shelter and have a, a family that's centered on the Christian faith. And uh, it, it really is, it's a blessing. We got to go to that orphanage, that home station basically where uh, Nao Gong would come and bring the kids. And he's been on two missions now. He's brought back almost 10 children and yeah, the, uh, the kids, are coming from such a, a very hard life where basically all they have is agriculture and opium because the uh, opium grows well over there in the mountains in the western southwestern Himalayans where they're from and their parents uh, that they, they don't have education they don't really they don't have anything and except for the agriculture and the slavery that civilization has 
put upon them, you know, because they they've been surrounded by civilization and uh, belittled by the majority Hindu governments and the majority Buddhists, and now these Naga people they're uh, being politically and economically starved. So we are uh, sounding the trumpet for them and uh, over here never forgetting them, you know, bringing up their cause to the people. And we are really blessed. We did have the opportunity to go and stay with them and walk to the bottoms of mountains to go and get water for just the daily needs. And that that was a blessing that we'll never forget. And yeah, other than that, we went to Mongolia. We stayed with one of Joy's friends. We traveled to Lake Kuv School, which is near the, I believe it's the Russian border. We traveled to Korea. We went to Singapore, Thailand, Cambodia. We went to India, of course. And we got to be involved with all of these people of different backgrounds. And from my background, you know, I, I grew up as an atheist. I was a wandering soul and I never stopped searching for truth so I, I did search through a lot of those religions that predominantly I, I started with Buddhism as a lot of people in my generation do because it's you know peaceful and people just want to uh, be at peace you know and I think that that's a special thing but it didn't have any answers and I, I wandered from Buddhism questioning myself about the truth of who we are while we're here how we got here and I found that Buddhism was based on a, off of Hinduism so I started studying Hinduism so that was interesting I went from the Buddhist places and I got to travel to the Hindu places and you know there they they have this very thorough uh, history of the fallen angels and these hybrid beings uh, that the Bible calls the Nephilim and how they had special powers and how they basically enslaved humanity and worked with certain portions of humanity and uh, mated with humanity and gave these offsprings. Specifically when we were in Cambodia, we went to Angkor Wat, which is one of the most famous Buddhist temples in the world. And it was, uh, it was in Laura Croft, the Tomb Raider movie, you know, the Angkor Wat is a very famous place, and we got to go there. We were blessed to go there and to share the gospel in this place that most people have literally never even heard of Christianity. They don't even know it exists. It's, it's crazy that there are still places like that in the world. But we got to go there, and we got to see that place and to share with the Buddhists, you know, these, these stones, they aren't worth your worshiping. But the history you got to look through that history. you got to study that history, and, and you'll find the root. So I was studying through Hinduism, but while we were at Angkor Wat, I looked at who the king was, who they said, uh, Jayavarman, he was a guy that, he was a king that oversaw the construction of the temple, and, you know, they they have his parents, so I looked at his dad, and then I looked at his dad's dad, and his dad's dad's dad, and I, I just traced it back as far as I could. And when you get to, uh, you know, so many generations, they say they the, the dad came from heaven. And that's something you see in a lot of cultures around the world, and those ancient um, reigning bloodlines, they claim that they're they're descendants of heaven. You know, that's very interesting. And we know, uh, after studying Hinduism, I studied the Egyptology, Sumerian mythology, ancient alien stuff, New Age ideas and concepts. You know, they, they tweak it in their own uh, deceptive way. But I studied the scriptures for what they were, and I studied the, the translations for what they were. And then uh, when you put it all together, you see a big picture start to form. And I started studying this book called the Colburn Bible, which is very interesting. Colburn is a, a type of language that was in uh, Ireland and the Celts, and they, they uh, very well might be descendants of Egypt. And they carried with them this combination of Celtic Druidic texts and Egyptian holy priest texts. 
and they put it together in this book called the Colburn Bible, which you introduced me to in 2007. And when I started reading that, it was very interesting because the story is that the Egyptians started writing this book, started putting this knowledge together after the Exodus. And the Exodus, you know, the Egyptians were left in shambles and they were basically, they were decimated. And they were left wondering, well, who is the God of those people who just left us like this? So they put together this text and put together as much of the mythologies that they could find about that the one true God. And I thought, okay, well, that that is one of my favorite books. I really enjoyed reading it. It was thorough. It was beautifully written. But it left me wondering one question. Who was that God of the Jews? And now, you know, I'm not in Egypt. I'm not confined to Egypt. I can actually go and I can study the books that we've received from those people. You know, we can study the Hebrew manuscripts, the Tanakh, the Aramaic Targum, the the Bible that we have today. So that's what I did. And when I opened up Genesis within the first book, within the first five chapters of that book, uh, it was like the big picture that I had been putting together from studying all the world religions. It, it finally came together. The Bible was like the key to unlocking all the mysteries of the past and of uh, all the, the holes that were left when I was studying through those ancient religions. And it was a blessing to be able to go to those places and to see the history and the, the temples and talk to the people that were there and to really, it, it gave me a way to relate with them and to share with them that, you know, I know where you're coming from. I, I studied the same way. I thought the same way that you do. But have, haven't you ever wondered about this? And often they, they said, yeah, but, you know, we just don't really think about it. Even Joy once, we were in, a, in an airport. We were stuck for hours waiting for our ride at a, in East India. And she went to buy a charger, our uh, external charger, our portable charger had went out. And she went to buy one at this little airport. And, you know, everywhere in India, they, they all have, like, if you go into a gas station that's owned by Indians, a lot of time you'll see in the side, they'll have this little, like, plot set up with a little statue and some incense burning. And all you, all you normally know is, oh, it smells good when I go into the Indian uh, restaurants or the Indian gas stations or whatever because they got the incense burning but they're worshipping the idols so Joy, she asked them have you ever wondered why you, you worship that statue and they said no We just, you know that's just what it is and she said don't you think it's like it's kind of stupid and they were, they were like yeah you're right it really, it really is and it's the same thing here we're just full of lukewarm individuals who don't really question who they are or why they're here or what they're really doing in the world they're just uh, following whatever uh, circumstance they were born into and they're just they're living until the day they die you know and it it's unfortunate but we were able to shake a lot of people up and ask them questions and get them to ask questions and we ended up in israel for the feast of trumpets 2017 we got to stand on the Mount of Olives while we watched the sun go down to begin the Feast of Trumpets. We got to meet people there and to, to blow trumpets and to sing praise songs to the Messiah on the mountain that he ascended from. And it was an amazing experience. But being there, we got to meet Jewish and Muslim people. You know, and th these were people that I didn't really grow up thinking about Judaism or Islam, and that wasn't really like what I studied, because as far as I was concerned, when I studied the Bible, you know, I saw the fulfillments of the scriptures in the Messiah. I saw the fulfillments of the prophecies that I was studying in the Messiah, and unfortunately, they they don't see it. So that scripture that you read earlier from 1 John 2.22 who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. 
So, you know, if we just go back to the words that the Messiah said, he said in John 8, you know, he was debating with the Pharisees. And they said to him, where is your father? And the Messiah answered, you neither know me nor my father. Because if you had known me, you would have known my father also. You know, these people, they, they're they lost. And the leaders, they are deceivers. Right. Literally, they, they are deceivers. So there's a, another verse I'll read real quick. Let me pull it up. And it's related to that First John 2, 22. It says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So you remember what the Messiah called them, right? What? He, he said, You are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So we have to wake up to this great deception that's taking place, not just in the Hindu side of the world or the Buddhist side of the world, but we have to wake up to what's happening in Israel. You know, in the churches in, in the West, we're all pro-Israel, pro-Israel, you know, Israel is great, we love Israel, They're, they are God's chosen people, but they don't know God, they don't know the Father, because they don't know the Son, yeah, exactly. and we know that the Son said, if you don't know me, you don't know the Father, right. so it, it's very unfortunate, there, I believe it was a, some big church in Canada or something, they they just came out with a public apology on converting Israelites or uh, converting the Jews. They said, we're so sorry for, you know, so many millennia or so many centuries we were trying to convert you. You know, we, we repent. We need to be more like you. Like, no, no. You have to get the faith, the understanding of the Messiah, or else you're following the deceiver. So that is uh, the topic of what we're going to talk about today, and I'm really excited to talk about the synagogue of Satan. And uh, yeah, I, I would love to share more about our travels and our trips, and maybe I'll get to one day, but I'd like to go ahead and get into this. Yeah, when we come back from break, we're two minutes out, but uh, the story of, of you and Joy in India reminds me of Abraham when he questioned uh, you know, his father worshiping idols mm -hmm. and how he was then led to the truth uh, and to relationship with the Most High God and also to the Son because people don't realize that Abraham knew the, of Christ as saving Messiah and that all of the patriarchs all throughout these stories, even from Adam onward, they knew about and shared testimony, redeemed them. And Absolutely. And so these are things that have been uh, misinterpreted, removed, extirpated, and uh, disappeared from knowledge. And that's why, you know, so much of the world where it says in Revelation 12, that that old serpent, that ancient dragon who deceiveth the entirety of the world. And so studying week by week, uh, study on the Aramaic Targum, it covers in great detail how knowledge and translation of the word of the Lord has been removed, even from the Pentateuch, and how this knowledge has been lost, especially to uh, the Israelites and to the Jewish people, so much so that you know they're still waiting for their Messiah when it was clear that uh, Yahushua was, and the Levitical feast days of the Most High God when he, so we'll get into that when we come back. We'll be right back, everyone. All right, welcome back, everybody. Let me go ahead and turn it over to you, Justin, so you can set the premise for the, what we're about to get into. Sure. Now, Revelation 2.9 says, this is the angel speaking to 
the church of Smyrna. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So that is the premise of what we're going to speak of today. And I appreciate you letting me speak on some of our travels in the first segment. And I'm so excited to get into this segment. We're going to be speaking on the past, present, and future of the synagogue of Satan. So some of the things we'll cover is messianic prophecies that the Jewish rulers ignored, the conspiracy to remove the details of the Messiah from the Tanakh, the push to create a third temple, uh, the Sanhedrin's attempt to replace the UN, and this is a, a new word that I'm coining, anti-anti-Semitism. <laughs> uh, with the synagogue of Satan, I think it's really important and very relevant that people reading Revelation 2.9 and 3.9, they say, it says that those who say they are Jews but are not. And we see that even in Israel and with the, the Rothschild, the New World Order, the powers that be, that often they portray themselves as being um, of this so-called Merovingian and Messianic bloodline and that one of the New Age concepts that uh, the elites are promoting is that Christ had children with Mary Magdalene and that this particular bloodline uh, they call it the Sangrael, and that it, their children are the ones that uh, birth the Merovingian kings, and that the New World Order elites are connected to this Merovingian bloodline, and that that is why they have the divine right to rule, when we know that, in truth, they are connected to the serpent and to Cain, and that Christ said of them, ye are of your father the devil, and he said also that, calling them a, a den of vipers, a brood of vipers, that their parents and their fathers have historically been the murderers of the prophets. And then he said specifically from Abel to Zacharias, Zacharias being the father of John the Baptist, who was the rightful high priest, and they murdered him in the Holy of Holies. And then John was ousted, and he, we know his ministry was out in the wilderness, and that he had to stay away uh, from the city because they were going to conspire his murder, and did in fact succeed uh, in killing him. Being him, John was beheaded, but uh, that he was the cousin of Yahushua, and we see that Mary and Elizabeth, uh, that they were cousins, and so they were related, but uh, the whole thing of Abel to Zacharias that shows us that the Pharisees who conspired the murder of Christ as Savior Messiah, that they were indeed the seed of the serpent mentioned in Genesis 3.15, as having enmity with the seed of the woman, and that Christ, when he would be born, he um, fulfilled upon his death on the cross the whole prophecy of Genesis 3.15 and the seed of the woman crushing the head of the serpent. And I've explained how it was that David, like 1,400, 1,600 years prior, had cut off the head of Goliath who was the Philistine giant, uh, their champion, uh, and that he took his head back to Jerusalem to show to the people as trophy that he indeed had killed their champion. And he buried Goliath's head there at Golgotha, Goliath of Gath, meaning Goliath of Gath. And then when Christ was crucified on the cross, he fulfilled again this prophecy of crushing the head of the serpent at the same time that it nipped at his heel. And so all that's one of the prophecies that he fulfilled in coming into flesh form and 
uh, redeeming humanity and bringing, as John said, behold the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And so let me give you a chance to speak on um, whatever you'd like to cover, whether it's synagogue of Satan or establishing the messianic prophecies, which even the book of Enoch, uh, which you know has been dated officially back to three, three and or two BC, uh, the third or second century BC, it shows to us and includes within it the prophecies, the messianic prophecies of the elect one and the son of man, which is exactly what Daniel references Christ as as well, and what Yahushua also, in speaking of himself, uh, he took and assume that title. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that uh, prophecy. And yeah, that's exactly what I want to get started with. In the beginning, we're going to talk about the past. And afterwards, we'll talk about the present and the future of the synagogue of Satan. So in the past, we're going to cover some of the messianic prophecies that were fulfilled very clearly, extremely clearly, and that were ignored, and prophecies that to this day are being taught as yet to be fulfilled in the synagogues by the rabbis and being twisted. And even some of them we'll see have been uh, changed in their wording. So the first one I want to say is Isaiah 53. And you, you brought up a really awesome uh, verse when John said, Behold, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world, the lamb of God. So I'm just going to read a few select verses. I suggest everyone, if you haven't read Isaiah 53, that you definitely do. It's one of the most famous messianic prophecies. In Isaiah 53, I'm just going to go through a few of the verses. In verse 3, it says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And when it says we here, who, who is that? That's Isaiah speaking, right? And he was, he was an Israelite. Right, right. So we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All right, now this is a verse that I'm going to present um, something very amazing and astonishing with regarding the Lamb of God. It says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. Now, he is the lamb that's brought to the slaughter, right? right. And we know if we go to Genesis 22.8, were taken to this story where Abraham, you know, he's established this covenant with the Most High, and the Most High tells him, take your only begotten son and sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. And yeah. Abraham's walking with Isaac, and he, uh, Isaac is helping him carry the fire and the wood, and he asks his dad, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. All right, now this is what I'm going to present to you. The word for burnt offering is ayin lamed he. It's Allah or Elah. And that is the same word that is used for ascend or to exalt. So we can read that again where it says, God will provide himself a lamb for exaltation, for ascending. We know what Jacob's ladder is, right? That's The ladder is the Messiah. If we read at the end of 
uh, John 1, I believe it says, you'll see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. He is the Lamb. He is the Lamb of God. As John said it, it's so true. It is the truth. It is not something that we can deny. It is the absolute truth that the Messiah, he was the Lamb that was presented as the exaltation of the Most High because he defeated death, as the ascension because he's the ladder of, of Jacob. That go, He allows us to ascend our prayers up straight into the throne of the Most High. And he was the offering because he was led during Passover. He was the Passover lamb, and his blood protects us from that angel of death that, that will come. Right. So I thought that that was pretty amazing, yeah. and I'm, I'm glad to be able to share. So I can keep going. I'm going to read from Psalm 22, Micah 5, 2, Isaiah 9, 6, and Amos 8, 9 through 10. Uh, but would you like to comment? Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I had talked about previous how the we did a week by week, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse study of the Aramaic Targum, and how what not a lot of people know about, and especially those that have never heard of the Targum, uh, and that don't know the details behind its coming into being, that it was a and is the oldest translation of the Hebrew Torah first into Aramaic. And it came about because of the diaspora, the under Nebuchadnezzar's exile, that the Israelites being taken to Babylon during that 70 years, they assimilated Aramaic so much so that when they returned, when Cyrus released them to rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the Holy Temple, and reinstituting worship, they had to translate the Hebrew into the Aramaic. And so they authorized this translation, which predates even the Greek Septuagint, which is also a Targum. And even the English King James Version of the Bible is also a Targum. It's a translation. But in reading and studying from this, one of the things that we noticed and that we share with uh, le uh, listeners and uh, readers is that there's 217 mentions of the word of the Lord in the first five books of the Pentateuch in the Aramaic translations. And when you look at and do a keyword search in the King James, there's only 11 mentions of the word of the Lord in those particular manuscripts and so in my mind it shows that there was a a, a specific um, attempt by whoever translators whoever somebody removed the inclusion and the relationship of the word of the lord with the ancient israelites and as we mentioned even uh, with abraham that the sacrifice of, of Isaac, that was on a Passover. It was on the 14th of Nisan. And it shows to us uh, that God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son, that it was actually a type and a shadow of what he would do for us as humanity in sending his own son to enter the flesh and to be this lamb without spot or blemish. Uh, the Passover lamb and that it would be through him that we are redeemed and that our salvation and our uh, first estate is restored to us. And so these kind of things are lost and have been um, skewed. And so, you know, we've I, I've done a number of shows now to share how it is in the specific passages that talk about um, the word of the Lord and his relationship with the ancient prophets all throughout time and history. And again, this knowledge becoming lost, that's why it is that even now the Israelites, uh, as Isaiah said, you know, they deny their Savior Messiah. They uh, don't even know um, those that have been led astray and deceived that truly these prophecies were fulfilled 
in the ancient past with his incarnation in the flesh form. So let me turn it back over to you. Right. Yeah. And, you know, this prophecy in Isaiah 53, that's so clear. It, it goes on and it continues, but we can move on. But before we do, I just want to share that if you go to Israel or go to New York or New Jersey or wherever a, a big Orthodox Jewish community is, and you share with them this chapter of Isaiah 53, they have to jump through loops and hurdles in order to get some kind of meaning out of it that doesn't clearly point to the Messiah who we know as Yahusha, or they, we call him Jesus in, in the West, Isa in Korea, Yeshu, Yeshua. But they they are jumping through loops. They're it's just so obvious, but we sat down in the Galilean mountains. Joy and I were staying at a workaway, working on this lady's uh, self-sustainable home farm and helping her out at her home. And the Feast of Tabernacles came, and we celebrated uh, the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, one of the days following, this Jewish guy, his name was Dove, he came and he was staying and I, you know, I was excited to be able to share with more people all of this knowledge that I had gained up and all of this understanding of prophecy. And I was like, you know, if he, he's never read this. There's no way that he's read Isaiah 53. And there's just no denying that that's the Messiah, right? So I read it to him. We read it every single verse together. And... The way that he said that it's explained to him is that that arm of the Lord that was bruised for the iniquities of the world was the Israeli nation, the nation of Israel. And I thought, that makes no sense, because as we pointed out earlier, Isaiah was saying that we have considered him stricken by God, and he died for our peace, right? Like, he's not saying that it was somebody else. It was, it was a man. It was a specific person that bared the iniquity of all of us that was bruised and chastised for our peace. So it is, it's so sad that there is so much deception. And as the Messiah said, you know, you are of your father, the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. There's no truth in him. And there is a huge war going on for souls. There has been a huge war going on for souls since man was made, you know, since the Garden of Eden. There's been a battle for souls. And these leaders, these Freemason elite, the Illuminati leaders that are one to rebuild this third temple, they're uh, altering these, these prophecies and the understanding. They're just, I just don't understand how they're deceiving so many people. I guess they're just like Roman Catholics just go to the mass. They're read to whatever the, priest wants to read and then they leave and then that's it you know they don't do much more studying than that right. and so that's what we need to take on we need to if we're going to go out and share this verse with people this chapter with people we need to be prepared to um not expect too much out of them right you know because they they don't have understanding yet they don't have the holy spirit they don't have wisdom yet so we have to let them read it and then just take it, take the deception apart bit by bit. And another chapter, another uh, amazing messianic prophecy that will help you do that is Psalm 22. And this goes hand in hand with Isaiah 53. It begins, it's a Psalm of David. It begins with the words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Do you remember what the Messiah said on the cross? He yeah. said, Ali, Ali, Lama, Sabachthani. He said this. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And if you read in the Gospel of Nicodemus, when the, the angel that was over Hades was speaking with Satan, he said, you know, that, the cry, the roar that 
the the Christ did when he was on the cross, I think that it might have been to deceive you. He was deceiving you because what was he saying? God didn't forsake the Messiah. The Messiah knew very well what he was doing. But the Messiah was referring us to this vision that David had. And in this vision, David's trying to reason. If you read through it, he's like, I, I don't understand. Why, why are you doing this, God? Because he is having the vision of being the Messiah on the cross. He said, uh, you know, my forefathers trusted in you and you delivered them. Why, why aren't you delivering me? And then it goes on and it gives this specifics about a, a Roman-style crucifixion that didn't come about. It wasn't a form of torture or a form of execution until the time of the Romans. And, you know, that was much later than King David. Yes. He, he goes on to specify the people around him. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted in Yahweh that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. You know, we know that was said. That's recorded in the Gospels. He said, uh, Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. The, the poured out like water we know when someone is... Uh, suffocated to death the the pericardial fluid it mixes with their blood and it, it's like water you know it says my heart is like wax you know it's like the water mixed with blood and when it poured out it poured out what seemed like the water and it says all my bones are out of joint and you know while you're hanging on the cross like that and you lose all your strength your your ligaments they they pull apart and your muscles tire out and then your bones become out of joint. And this is something that happens in a crucifixion, not something that happened in David's day. This was an evil and a, a terrible death. That, and this is a prophecy. It, he went on to say, My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked who, who was around the Messiah when all he was those, being crucified? All those that conspired his murder. Yeah, all those Jews, right? They, they called themselves Jews. Let his blood be upon us. Right, and our children. Yes. And it says, The dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. They pierced my hands and my feet. You know, another time it said that they'll look upon me whom they have pierced. I think that was in Zechariah 12, something like that. And that's Yahweh saying, they'll look upon me whom they have pierced. But you know what the Jews have done to this? To this chapter and this verse, chapter 16 in Psalm chapter 22, they changed the wording in their Masoretic text and the in their Tanakh to say, instead of saying, uh, the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. It says, like a lion, my hands and my feet. Uh, of course. It, it makes no sense. And there, that's the only manuscript that says it that way. If you look at the other manuscripts, they all say, clearly, they've pierced my hands and my feet. Uh, it goes on to say, they part my garments among them right. and cast lots upon my vesture. And that is recorded in the Gospels. You know, very clearly that it happened, you know? Yes, they cast lots for his raiment. They, they did. They cast lots for his raiment. And then it, it goes on to say, uh, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation while I praise you. And, you know, this is David seeing the resurrection. He's like, wow, you know, even though I was just tortured and killed, I'm going to stand up. Yeah. I'm, he's going to be raised from the dead. Yeah. So there's a, another verse that's in here. And it says, uh, save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me. Okay. We're at break. So, okay. Uh, 
uh, we'll pick it up on the other side, everyone. We'll be right back for second half. All right, welcome back, everybody, for second hour. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Secrets of Build here on Truth Frequency Radio. And uh, once more, I do appreciate all of you taking the time to be with us this evening. I'm speaking to my son, Justin James Garcia, who works with me with sacredwordpublishing.com and also uh, his lovely wife, Joy, my daughter-in-law, who we're so greatly blessed to have as part of the family, who does so much for the company and ministry as well, it works with us in that capacity. And uh, we're so greatly blessed and fortunate to be able to serve the kingdom in this manner and to have our focus on bringing forth the ancient manuscripts and to help others to really discern those of you that are. And so let me turn it back over to my son. And uh, Yes, thank you very much. So right before the break, we were reading Psalm chapter 22. And I was speaking of one last verse that we're going to get into later on. It, it says, uh, Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I looked at this verse and it made no sense to me. It says, you've heard me from the horns of the unicorns. So I'm just going to drop that little verse there, Psalm chapter 22, 21. We'll come back to that a little bit later when we're talking about uh, some future events. And we'll go ahead and skip over to Micah 5, 2. And we'll just read it really quick. It, it's a prophecy that says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though you be little amongst the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So we see here that this person that's going to come forward, whose roots are from everlasting, you know, eternal, he's going to come from Bethlehem. All right, so let's keep that in mind. He's eternal, and we know he, he was born in Bethlehem. You can still go and see the, the milk grotto is there even to this day. Joy and I went and we spent Passover 2018. Uh, the day before Passover, we were in Bethlehem, staying with a Catholic family there. And they, they told us that if you go to the milk grotto and you talk to this certain priest, he has a key to this catacombs that's underneath the milk grotto cathedral. And they claim that that's where they keep all the bones of the children that were killed when okay. Herod rose up. And, uh, you know, we didn't do that. We don't want to see the bones. And you don't know if that's really those bones or not. But it, it was very interesting, very crazy. I've heard it said that all Catholic churches are built on somebody's grave or some bones. But anyways, we will uh, move on from Micah 5.2, where it talks about from Bethlehem, the one that would come to be ruler, that's roots was from everlasting. And we're going to read Isaiah 9.6. It says, For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So we know it's this son, this son. You know, whenever you tell the Jew, they or a Muslim for that matter, they, they said, you know, God has no son. There's no son of God. And, you know, they, they don't understand this concept that the father and the son are one. Yes. If you look right here, his, his name is Ad Ab in Hebrew. Ad Ab, the everlasting father you know in micah 5 2 we saw his roots are from forever he's everlasting he's always been the father he always will be the father even though he came into the flesh born of a virgin he's still the everlasting father and amen yeah amen and you know it says also his name shall be called wonderful Normally, people read it as, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, you know, and we'll just be like, he's so wonderful. But that word wonderful, it literally means in Hebrew, hard to understand. Isn't that very interesting 
how difficult it is for the world to understand their creator, the infinite, that he came into the flesh. Right. So very interesting. But you can't deny it because he defeated death. Yeah. He's the only one in history that defeated death. Yeah. He rose the dead from the grave. He healed the blind. He cured those with all manners of sicknesses and cast out demons. He fulfilled the prophecies right. that he gave. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. One, one other thing I'd like to mention here is that when you read um, some of the extra biblical texts like the Gospel of Gamaliel, which when you study the Passion of Christ, this particular text gives more detail and more understanding about that particular day and the unfoldings of it. And what a lot of people don't realize is that the prophecies of his resurrecting after three days were widely known, and even the Jews, that's one of the reasons why they sent the Roman guard to be there, was to try to prevent his resurrection or to keep people from uh, being witness to it. And we know that they paid off the, uh, the Roman guards that were there uh, because they were absolutely witness to the resurrection of the Christ and to the fulfillment of uh you know this in prophecy and also uh, that even Pilate he knew they all knew that he was going to resurrect after three days because he had told them uh, the apostles knew everybody knew and so that was one of the reasons why they heavily guarded and tried to prevent and paid off yes absolutely and we're definitely going to cover that as well when we talk about how they uh, tried to cover it up. But well, I'm just going to read one last uh, verse, one last quote from Amos 8, chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. And I know, Dad, you're going to be very excited to talk about this because it talks about the luminaries and how the world works. And this is amazing. Amos 8, 9 through 10. It says, And it shall come to pass in that day, says Elohim, Yahuwah, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day, and I will turn your feasts into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation, and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon every head, and I will make it as the morning of an only sun, and the end thereof as a bitter day. So we know the Messiah was crucified on the Passover, and that's even written in the Talmud. You know, we know the Messiah was, he was executed on the Passover. He, and uh, here it says that the sun would go down at noon and would darken in the clear day. Now, Passover, what lunar day is that, Dad? Passover is the full moon Sabbath. Uh, and it's always connected to the 15th. Um, and the 15th, well, it's the 14th, which is the eve of the full moon. Right. But the unleavened bread is always the Sabbath, the full moon Sabbath. And we have that plotted out in our lunar solar calendar. And so, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, you know, also the 15th of Tishri, which is Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, it is also always celebrated uh, on a, a Sabbath, and you'll notice that there's a seven-day festival, the, that the Passover festival uh, is seven days from the 15th to the 22nd, and in the same way in Tishri, uh, same way. Right, so we see that the moon is on the opposite side of the sun. It's, a, it's a, the full moon time, and Every solar eclipse recorded in history is during the lunar conjunction when the moon is dark, you know, right before the first sliver, right after the last sliver was noted, you know, we call it the lunar conjunction. And that's when the solar eclipses happen. But this solar eclipse, we can't call it a solar eclipse, but it was recorded as a solar eclipse by the Greek historian Phlegon. 
He marked during the reign of Tiberius Caesar that there was a solar eclipse, an unexpected solar eclipse, in the middle of the day during the full moon. Now, how many times has that happened throughout history? One time. I believe you know, one time, maybe a couple others in uh, the Bible. We talked about that. I don't know specifically. I don't want to be dogmatic, but you know that time during Tiberius Caesar's reign, that's when the Messiah was walking. That was when his ministry was taking place. That was when he was on the earth. That was when he was crucified. The sun went dark during the feast, as it says here in Amos eight ten. I will turn your feasts into mourning. You know, M O U R N I N G, mourning, like you know, sadness there. And it would be the mourning of an only son, because the only begotten son, he was crucified on that day. And it was a divine occurrence that the sun was darkened. So the whole world, you know, they trembled in fear. They were horrified at what had happened. And then there was an earthquake, and the veil of the sanctuary and the temple was torn. And then all these old saints and uh, prophets and Patriarchs, they all came out of the graves and they were just wandering around, <laughs> you know, like right. they, it was so it, it's very well recorded in history. And it's not just one book that talks about it. You know, my generation always says it's just a book of fairy tales. There's no legitimacy behind any of this. But I just quoted the Greek historian Phlegon. He wasn't a Christian. He was just some secular historian that was recording uh, the times of the different Caesars, and he talked about this one time, this amazing occurrence happened, and it just so happens that it's also recorded in the Bible. And it's also recorded in prophecy as it was supposed to happen. It did happen. Right. Yeah, I'll share also really quick and short a letter that Pontius Pilate sent to Tiberius Caesar, the emperor, uh, about um, here it says, and it's pretty short, it says, Upon Jesus Christ, whose case I had clearly set forth to you in my last, at length by the will of the people, a bitter punishment has been inflicted, myself being in a sort unwilling and rather afraid. A man by Hercules so pious and strict no age has ever had, nor will have. But wonderful were the efforts of the people themselves and the unanimity of all the scribes and chief men and elders to crucify this ambassador of truth, notwithstanding that their own prophets and after our manner the sibyls warned them against it, and supernatural signs appeared while he was hanging, and in the opinion of the philosophers threatened destruction to the whole world. His disciples are flourishing in their work and the regulation of their lives, not belying their master. Yea, in his name, most beneficent. Had I not been afraid of the rising of the sedition among the people who were just on the point of breaking out, perhaps this man would still have been alive to us, although urged more by fidelity to your dignity than induced by my own wishes. I did not, according to my strength, resist that innocent blood, free from the whole charge brought against it, but unjustly through the malignity of men should be sold and suffer, yes, as the scriptures signify, to their, signify to their own destruction. And so, and, uh, and people can read even the letter before this, where there's a great description, a physical description of, of Christ uh, as explained to Tiberius and so he speaks about at length in that letter as well the how there was three hours of darkness and uh, the stars came out and appeared and this was you know at noon time noon to 3 uh, p.m. where it says uh, specifically in the scriptures as mentioned um, you know uh, of the crucifixion and so yeah, these things are absolutely historical, um, and many people, even the the Chinese, have written in their prophecy uh, the account of this particular day. Absolutely, and it's important to know that 
it was foretold that the Messiah would suffer. Like this is something that it it was going to take place. You know, yeah. the the true believers in Israel, they knew that this was something that was going to happen. And there are many who came out of Israel and believed upon the Messiah. You know, all his apostles, tons of Galileans, tons of people even in, in Jerusalem, they knew that this was going to happen, that the Messiah would be crucified. And I, I just have to read this, Zechariah 12, 10. It, it just goes so well with Amos 8, 9, and 10. It says, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Uh -huh. This is Yahweh speaking, the Lord. This is the Lord speaking. They will look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for an, his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Yes. Yeah, he, he can't put it any better. I mean, my goodness. And if you can't see that connection, really, you, you're you just denying. You know, mm -hmm. the, yeah, it, it's, a, it's being happy in ignorance, I think. Right, right. You know, it says in 2 Thessalonians 2, I'll send them a great deception in that all should be damned who believe not in the truth or who, who didn't have a love for the truth. You know, when the early apostles went out to some of the Jews, this is where you get the idea of the Bereans, because there were some of the Jews that didn't believe, but they still accepted the apostles in. They didn't just condemn them as heretics because they didn't agree. They took what the apostles were saying, and they searched out these exact same scriptures that we're reading today, and they saw the truth, and they were converted in their hearts, you know, and they became believers. How amazing is that? You know, they, they knew. We still have these scriptures. But our next little segment, the time is just going by so fast. You know, we need like 20 hours to cover this. We're still in the past. We haven't even gotten to the present. We can but, do it. Yeah, so I, just next in our talking about the past, I just want to bring up one quote from Justin Martyr. He was speaking to a Jew named Trifo. And Justin Martyr was a first century Christian apologist. He was a very, very studied individual who was into apologetics, which apologetics means defending your faith. And he was speaking with a Jew and trying to teach this Jew from his own scriptures. And it's a really well recorded book. I suggest anyone read it who, you know, daily has conversations with Jews or wants to go to Israel and, uh, be a missionary, even though that's illegal. But I'll just read the quote real quick. Here, Trifo remarked, We asked you, first of all, to tell us some of the scriptures which you allege have been completely canceled. And then Justin Martyr said, it says, And I said, I shall do as you please. From the statements then which Ezra made in reference to the law of the Passover, they have taken away the following. All right, he said that they took this away out of the scriptures. Quote, And Ezra said to the people, This Passover is our Savior and our refuge. And if you have understood, and your heart has taken it in, that we shall humble him on a standard there, thereafter, hope in him, then this place shall not be forsaken forever, says the God of hosts. But if you will not believe him and will not listen to his declaration, you shall be a laughing stock to the nations. That goes hand in hand with what we're talking about. You know, Passover, okay. the Savior, he's lifted up on a standard. All right, and then he goes on, he says, From the sayings of Jeremiah, they have cut out the following. I was like a lamb. I was like a lamb that is brought to the slaughter. They devised a device against me, saying, come, let us lay on wood, on his bread. You know, he's the bread of life, and they're trying to lift him up as a sacrifice. They said, let us blot him out from the land of the living, and his name shall no more be remembered. What a joke, right? His name is the name above all names, and we're still 2,000 years later exalting him, 
praise Yah, praise Yah. But it says, uh, that was the end of the quote. It says, and since this passage from the sayings of Jeremiah is still written in some copies of the scriptures in the synagogues of the Jews, where it has only been a short time since they were cut out, and since from these words it is demonstrated that the Jews deliberated about the Christ himself to crucify and to put him to death, he himself is both declared to be led as a sheep to the slaughter, as was pred predicted by Isaiah, and is here represented as a harmless lamb. But being in difficulty about them, they give themselves over to blasphemy. And again, from these sayings of the same Jeremiah, these have been cut out. The Lord God remembered his dead people of Israel who lay in the graves, and he descended to preach to them his own salvation. Wow. Awesome, right? Yeah. Amazing. So I'm not sure I, I need to go looking for these quotes. If they're in any of like the Dead Sea Scrolls, I'm sure they're they're still in there. But even in the first century AD, there was already this attack on the Tanakh and on the prophecies that were being taught in the synagogues to remove the Messiah. And, you know, it's the same war that's been going on since uh, Cain killed Abel. It's the same war that, that's been going on since the Garden of Eden. It's the enmity between the bloodlines. And they're trying to cover up the salvation that is freely given to every person in the world if they would accept, believe, be converted, and repent in their heart. Right. You know, and, that's the war. Right, exactly. And the enemy has been organized. Uh, mm -hmm. Evil is so organized, and we don't realize that about, you know, the synagogue of Satan and the New World Order and the bloodline elites that they have been at every turn of the way since the garden waging war against the truth and trying to hide scripturally the coming and the prophetic fulfillment of Yahushua as Christ and as Savior Messiah. And that's why, in my opinion, so much, as we were talking about with even the removal of the word of the Lord from um, you know, the English and modern translations but that you can find all of these verses included in the Aramaic Targum in the translations that were uh, available now to us uh, th that before these changes were you know took place <clears throat> and and it shows that it was not an accident you don't just somehow over 200 times remove the word of the Lord from a, a later translation. It's not accidental. It shows organized uh, effort and that somebody uh, was specific to, as you said, with, you know, the with the hands and the feet. Those kind of things are not just translational errors or mistakes. They are purpose distortions and that the seed of the serpent, uh, they've been attempting at every way to distort the scripture, even attacking the book of Enoch, in my opinion, or the messianic prophecies of the son of man, the elect one, those kind of things. And it's only been, you know, um, since the 18th century that that book was restored to public consideration. And even now, the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, confirmation of all the things that we're talking about, the book of Enoch, uh, things of that nature, um, God is pouring out his spirit upon all flesh in these last days. And Enoch even wrote that he would be writing and scripting this truth for a distant and remote generation. And in my opinion, uh, we are the beneficiaries of that effort and that spirit being poured out on all flesh, that God is bringing all things to light. Uh, so that nobody can claim ignorance or have excuse that they did not receive the truth. You know, this is also part of the Great Commission, the gospel being taught to every, the, all the ends of the world. I would accept it and seek it out. But uh, we're at break again, so we'll be right back for final segment, everyone. I hope that you've been enjoying the show. 
Um, the people in the chat room are really uh, thanking you, Justin. And Praise God. God bless. Uh, we'll be right back. All right. Welcome back, everybody, for final segment. Uh, do you want to just go ahead and turn it back over to you, son, so you can uh, get through? I know we'll have to do a follow-up, but whatever we can uh, complete in this show, and then we'll schedule another to do a, a second part in this series because I'm sure we're not going to be able to cover everything. But um, if you would, can you give out once more all of your contact your, any kind of website that you'd like to share anything of that nature yeah of course i'm everywhere that you can find zen we're completely partners in the ministry at sacredwordpublishing.com you can email us at sacredwordpublishingllc at gmail.com and we always take prayer requests and just any questions comments if you have any questions at all people are always uh, there waiting for your contact and wanting to pray with you or speak with you or help seek out truths with you. We're always there. And yeah, we're definitely not going to get through everything, but <laughs> I think it will work out for the best. What are you saying, uh, Share about the Digital Book Readers Club as well. Okay, sure. Every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, we meet in the discord lounge and we also live stream on the zen garcia youtube channel and we do about 30 minutes worth of reading 10 minutes worth of fellowship 20 minutes worth of uh, discussion about the scriptures that we're reading and right now we are specifically reading from the great commission 2 the gospel of nicodemus the acts of pontius pilate and we have a family that has really been growing and we're always looking for more people to join. It's basically just like a, a Bible study that you would join at any church. And instead of meeting in a dark room, we meet on our computers in a chat room and we speak together, we pray together, and we really are it, it, like a family. It's a great blessing. Uh, we will post a link in the description for our Discord channel, and if you would like to join us, we'd love for you to come and read and fellowship with us, and uh, it's open to the public. You just have to request, and then you will be allowed in. And uh... All right. Yeah, absolutely. Come and join us. Uh, regarding what we're speaking on today, we've covered pretty thoroughly the past uh, of the Synagogue of Satan, the prophecies that they've denied and that they've altered the words to and that they've all together removed from their Tanakhs and just completely uh, disregarded in their Talmudic interpretations or corrupted the meaning of. So I think we can go ahead and move on into some of the stuff that's taking place right now regarding uh, the Synagogue of Satan and their agenda. And as far as the future goes of the Synagogue of Satan, maybe we can do a, another show on that. So recently, I think it was a, a couple of weeks ago, there was this rabbi that was called to the U.S. House, and he was called to give the invocation. And I've given the invocation at some big government meetings before. When I was in the Air Force, I gave the invocation at uh, a leadership school graduation, and everything that you are praying in your invocation it's all uh, checked out beforehand. Somebody's checking it out. Somebody's making sure that, you know, it's acceptable to be presented. And this guy, his name was Rabbi Gershon Avtson. And he gave the invocation in the house because the people were offended that a Christian would do it and mention Jesus Christ because they don't believe in Christ. And they thought that the Jews, they're more of, you know, worldly uh, acceptable people for whatever reason. So they called this rabbi in. And when he was giving his speech, he mentioned these things called the seven Noahide laws. And he claims that they were outlined in Genesis and or Exodus. And it's a total lie. He's 
totally lying because there's no seven commandments written anywhere. You know, we're given the Ten Commandments explicitly, and then we have the Law of Moses that has 613 commands. But the seven Noahide laws, they are 100% taken out of the Talmud. The Talmud, it's like in Islam, they have the Hadiths that the Imams have written. And this Talmud, it was written by uh, different rabbis, and it, a lot of it's just these art, these rabbis arguing back and forth about certain things, and the Noahide laws are taken out of this. And why it's important for us to be aware of today is because these Noahide laws they were passed into law in the U.S. Uh, in, in into U.S. law, and in the Noahide laws. You know, they say that this is for every descendant of Noah, which we believe that the entire world was filled after the flood with the descendants of Noah. So they believe these are the seven laws for every person. And within it, it labels Christians as idolaters, and we deserve, according to this rule, to be beheaded. Which is interesting because you see in Revelation uh, that the uh, those that wash their robes white in the, the blood of the Lamb that they have been beheaded and they and we know that according to prophecy that the Antichrist comes to power before Yahushua returns in Second Advent and that the beast system is imposed the mark of the beast which prevents buying and selling. All of these things come first before uh, the end of days. Yeah, not to mention, I'm sure many of the listeners are aware that there were thousands of guillotines that were purchased and, and uh, given out all across the U.S., isn't that just really weird? Why do they need guillotines? But then you put together that, oh, well, the Noahide law said that all the Christians should be killed. And then you start wondering, oh, well, maybe the Bible was right when it said we're going to be delivered up yeah. to give our testimony. Right. And we're going to have an option. We're going to either stick to our faith or we're going to lay down our heads on that guillotine and be delivered up to to a better day and a better body, you know? Love they, not your life unto the death. Right. Yes. But this is something that Israeli News Live, Stephen and Yana Ben Noon, they do a great job exposing this. I really suggest people checking them out as well because uh, they'll also be at the Sacred Word Revealed Conference. Praise Yah. They, yes. they are a wonderful couple that are studying super hard in the Messianic Jewish side of things to wake up the Jews. And, uh, you know, because Stephen was a Jew. I mean, he's still, he, he's got the blood, he's got the connections, and he's become a believer in the Messiah. And it's a beautiful thing that he's spending so much time exposing these things. Right. And they do a really great job of talking about the Noahide laws and all of that. So, and revealing, you know, the synagogue of Satan and how right, is right, leadership, and even here in America as well, you know, APAC and other organizations that we also are controlled by synagogue of Satan, the eye at the top of the Illuminati pyramid, right, that powers the principalities, the rulers of darkness, wickedness in high places. They are the controlling mechanism behind all the governance. You know, they. Print mm -hmm. the money and loan it to interest and loan it at interest to the governments of the world. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the the Balfour Declaration was given to Lord Ro uh, Rothschild. Exactly. You know, they were all Freemasons. They're all uh, Jews, and their highest um, symbol is the temple. They all they just want to rebuild this temple. It is very interesting that nowadays, uh, from Passover, I remember, there were all of these news 
stories that were going around about sacrifices near the Temple Mount. And they they have this makeshift altar that they're sacrificing again on. And, you know, in prophecy, it says that the sacrifices are going to be restarted. Right. Because the false Messiah is going to stop them. Yes. So who knows how long the sacrifices are going to be uh, continued for before this false messiah comes but they are just up in arms just shouting and they're so ready they're just calling anyone they can the messiah they're like this guy is probably the messiah oh this guy he's probably the messiah we're just keeping an eye on him but yeah definitely the messiah is coming right now and we're just waiting on cyrus to give us the go-ahead to build up our temple again Uh and you know they call Trump Cyrus. There was even a coin that was made that has Trump and Cyrus's face next to each other. They, they're they really, they're pushing this so hard for this reconstruction of this third temple, which we know the true temple is going to come out of heaven. New Jerusalem is going to come out of heaven. But they're wanting to reconstruct this temple, and they... I know at the upper echelons of of this organization, they know what they're doing. You know, they're the deceivers. But the people, they're just being so deceived. They're just following along like sheep led to the slaughter. You know, it's so sad to see that they're getting ready to worship this Antichrist. So what can we do as Christians who have our eyes open, who know, you know, we have a love for truth, All we can do, we can sow seeds. We can say, you know, guys, the Messiah already came. And if you study your scriptures carefully, you know that there is going to be a great deception. This false Messiah is going to come. He's going to sit in what you call your temple, and he's going to claim to be the the Most High. Yes. You know, and it's taboo for us. It's, It's taboo for Christians, unfortunately, for us to to speak out against the modern state of Israel because we're called anti-Semitic or we're called, you know, the scripture that says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And everyone says, yeah, that, that's Israel. That's the chosen people, the chosen, uh, the Jews. The Jews, they're the chosen people of God. But what about Galatians 3.28, 29? There is no more Jew or Gentile any longer. We're all one in Christ. And everyone who does not confess Christ is what? The spirit of the Antichrist. Exactly. Yeah, if if they don't know the Son, they don't know the Father. And these people, their faith is lacking substance. They're lukewarm, you know? Right. it's very unfortunate, but they have a large power, like you said, that the organization of evil has been working. The mystery of iniquity has been working for thousands of years. Their plans are so deep, deeply constructed, and they're just following a blueprint at this point. You know, they're following uh, an outline. You want to talk about the outline a little bit, the protocols? Yeah. And we see that they reveal, and even though a lot of people believe that this, the protocols of the learned elders of Zion uh, are, you know, disinformation or propaganda or that they were the other side of it, they're from the elites and how they acquire weapons for silent wars, they talk about their agenda and how they were going to put forth and to succeed in what is this global domination. Uh, Albert Pike's vision for fomenting three world wars as means to establish a one world order and world government, and that it was also instrumental in creating a a Zionist state. And they talk about how uh, using these three wars to bring forth this League of Nations, the United Nations, policy, and I believe to be uh, the blooming of the fig tree. And then we see in Zechariah that it says that Jerusalem will be made a cup of trembling amongst the nations. And 
you know better than I, having traveled over to Palestine and seen, you know, the animosity that occurs between the uh, Israeli, the border guards and the Palestinian people, you know, they are being shot, killed, murdered. There's the one activist, Rachel Corey, who went over there and they ran over her with a bulldozer and killed her because she was trying to protect a Palestinian home from being bulldozed. I mean, the kind of tactics and the kind of animosity, it truly is the catalyst for what is now the ongoing, um, as far as the extremists, the Zionists, uh, Jews, and the Christians, and also the radical Islamists, that this opposition is being stoked and inflamed. And we know that there's, you know, the whole boogeyman, uh, even the Likud party, they started Hamas, which is the radical arm of the Palestinian state. And so this is controlled opposition in the same manner that we see that Al Qaeda was funded through the Pakistani ISI by the CIA. And so we created, you know, and, and the, the so-called terrorists that we bring up as a jack-in-the-box every once in a while uh, to set forth an agenda to war and to create what was the invasion of, um, of Iraq and also uh, in Afghanistan and others. You know, there were so many seven nations that they said they were going to take down before they ta attacked Iran. And we see that these kind of things are being uh, plotted out and also um, uh, occurring, like Libya, uh, Syria now is the, the target of the globalist state. Um, and Iran is what would be, in my opinion, the one that inflames and sets to conflagration the whole Middle East. And even now we see that there, the whole Ezekiel and Jeremiah wars, the description of the nations and the and Turkey and Iran have a pact with one another, and that has never existed prior. And this is described in Come and Surround Israel. And so all of these things are prophetically being fulfilled, and yet, you know, so many people still deny and are not interested and have no uh, no consideration for comfortable in their luxury. I mean, that's a definition of America and uh, a lot of what are the Western cultures who having it really well and being blessed um, do not see the prophetic side of all things coming to pass. Yeah, I just want to read a couple uh, scriptures that talk about this. In Daniel eleven fourteen, 14, it says, they're talking about the end times, the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. And we know that, that that's what's happening. These bankers that have enslaved the world, that have held power since the times of Egypt and from the time of Babylon, you know, these people that implemented slavery systems and banking systems to establish a line of credit, a.k.a. debt, they are doing everything they can, like you said, to establish the, the unions that are spoken of in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And they're doing what they can to fulfill Isaiah 17 and Jeremiah 49, and they're trying to destroy Iraq and destroy Syria and they're all they're trying to rush in this day the day of of the Lord yeah. but you know it, it's they are warned in the Old Testament and the prophecies you know it says woe to those that desire the day of the Lord right. to what end is it for you the day of the Lord is darkness and not light that's Amos 5:18 and if you continue reading in Daniel eleven fourteen, it says, 
They exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. So we know, you know, there's a destruction that's coming. There's a big destruction that's coming. And I know we're getting to the end, but I said that I was going to talk about that verse in Psalm 22. And it was the one, uh, Psalm 22, 21, it says, Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. And this is kind of getting into uh, the future tense which I know we're going to do another show on, but I just want to cover this real quick. The horns of the unicorns, you know, the unicorns is some uh, symbology, some word that was a, a symbology. And what I really want to look at is the word for horns. It's a kiren. And it's a place that was conquered by Israel. It means horn. It means hill. But it was also specifically a place that was conquered by Israel that scholars believe is in Bashan. So if we know anything about end times prophecy, you know, when the Messiah returns, where is he going to be coming from? He's going to be coming from the east with his garments dyed what color? His garments, they're going to be red, you know, and he's going to be coming from Edom, and he's going to be coming on this war spree. You know, it says his wings are going to be spread over the land, and all of the people, you know, it says their faces are going to be, like, melting, and everything, it says in Second Thessalonians 2, he's going to destroy the son of perdition with the brightness of his coming. He's going to be coming with a destruction for all those that stand against him. So we have to do our best to wake people up, to know their true creator, their true lover. You know, it says in John 15, 13, that greater, man, greater love has no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Yeah. And that's, ex yeah, it, you took the words out of my mouth. That's exactly what he did for us. It says in Romans 5, 8, God, but God commended his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right. You know, he, he looked at us and he saw all of our unworthiness, all of our sins. None of us were worthy. None of us were the Messiah, you know. But he looked at us and he said, I love them. You know, there, there are some of those people in that fallen world of duality and he knows us and he's chosen us out of the world and he chose to die for us out of love, out of love. It's all about love. Our whole life here is all about love. But the, the world is all about money. It's all about greed. It's all about control. They want to take our freedom away from us. But I just have to share the message with everyone that's listening that we are free indeed through Christ. When His Spirit hits you, there's nothing that can hold you back. You know, death, it looks like the end when we close our eyes and we can only imagine darkness, but when the Spirit's upon you, you can see past the death.